Football is a sport that spanned for more than two millennia, and it started peaking in the last century giving birth to many football stars from players, coaches, referees, and other football personalities. And today, we're gonna look at three very influential footballers that are apparently forgotten in today's world. Alright, let's begin. Before Ronaldo, before Luis Figo, and before old man Eusebio, there was another Portuguese great. Fernando Peroteo, Portugal's most underrated player and football's most prolific goalscorer of all time, and I seriously do mean it. He was born in 1918 in the Angolan city of Hompata. He is of Spanish descent though. He had quite a normal childhood. He loved football and especially sporting Lisboa. But because of his physique, he was recommended to ditch football for other sports like gymnastics as well as swimming, rowing and basketball. Luckily for him, he returned to practice in football. From the age of 14 to 19, he joined multiple youth academies. One of them was Sporting Club de Luanda, who was back then affiliated with Sporting Club of Lisboa. His talent attracted many scouts, which granted him a ticket to Portugal to showcase that talent on the big stage. In 1937, Pedro Teo made his breakthrough debut with Lisboa, against none other than Benfica, in which he bagged a brace. This consolidated his place in the first team, and as a reward for his performance, his salary was doubled. So, why is this guy special? In his not-so-long career that spanned 12 seasons, he has scored 544 goals in 334 games, scoring 42 hat-tricks. That's 1.62 goals per game. Not even Pelé or Messi or Gerd Müller scratch the ratio of a goal per game. That tells you about how special that record is. Now, some of you will tell me that he's a hack. But, 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 but Zio, he only played against farmers and part-time plumbers. You can't compare him with today's players. Well, I can't really argue with you about that. It is kinda true. Sometimes he did score 8 goals in a single game. However, we're talking about the 1940s. By that definition, if he's facing farmers, he's most likely a farmer too. In his amazing senior career, he stayed loyal to Sporting Lisboa, for 12 seasons before he retired in 1949. He was nicknamed the Tank and also the Tiger. A complete striker, fast, good in air and was capable of scoring with both legs. He was so good that he never scored less than 37 goals per season. His best one was in 1937-1938 when he scored 57 goals in 30 games. He managed to win 11 titles and was crowned 6 times as the best Portuguese player. He is best remembered for being the brightest star of Lisboa's forward line of five players called the Five Violents. His last official game, or should I say his farewell match, was in the 25th of September 1949 in which he expressed his gratitude in a very emotional speech to the Sporting Lisboa fans. Unfortunately, his international career wasn't as successful, scoring 15 goals in 20 games solely due to World War II who rendered international games very, very scarce. He also had a bad spell coaching Portugal and was sacked only after two games. Funny enough, he was the one who granted a debut to another African-born Portuguese legend, Eusebio da Silva Ferreira. On the 28th of November 1978, following a heart attack at the age of 60, Pedro Teo died. Lived in Portugal, born in Angola from Spanish descent, Fernando Peroteo is one of the most forgotten greats of the beautiful game. The second player on my list is Arthur Friedenreich, a pioneer of Brazilian football and football's first ever global superstar. Born in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1892 to Oscar Friedenreich, his father a German businessman and Mathilde a Brazilian woman of African descent. Because of his mixed blood, Fried wasn't very welcomed to play football during that era. It was hard for his kind to choose football or any kind of sports activity as a viable career choice. He even used to comb and straighten his hair and put powder on his skin just to appear more white. He truly lived in a society. He was even denied playing in the 1921 South American Championship because of his origins. Luckily for him, because of his German father, at the age of 17, he was able to start his senior career in Sport Club Germania, a Brazilian football team founded by Germans in 1899. 
Now, during his career, in Brazil, like most of the world back then, football was still an amateur sport. Freed played for seven different clubs, the likes of Sao Paulo, Atletico Mineiro, Flamengo, and most importantly, Club Atletico Paulistano, in which he played for 12 seasons. Hmm, 12 seasons. What a coincidence. 12 seasons too. Hmm. Arthur was a striker not like others. According to a chronicle that described his style of playing, he was a calm and smart forward. It's believed that he popularized efficiency instead of flashy football. He invented feints and curved goals. He did not play for the stands, but he prioritized the team's success by both offering selflessly to his teammates and also scoring a hell lot of goals. Well, did you know that Pele was not the only guy to claim scoring more than a thousand goals? Yep, you guessed it. The first one was another Brazilian by the name of Frieden Reich. Now, there's a lot of controversy and misinformation and we do not exactly know the right numbers. Some sources say it's 1229 goals in 1329 games. 0.92 goals per game. As I said a minute ago, football back then was still amateurish. We don't have the full records and people didn't care about who scored or who didn't. But still, the stats seemed too much inflated and some journalists attempted to find the exact numbers using some of the few popular newspaper files. One of them called Alexander da Costa ended up with 554 goals in 561 games. And another journalist, Severino Filo, ended up with 558 goals in 561 games. Even looking at these numbers, it's a lot. 0 0.99 goals per game. It tells you that he surely was a very prolific goal scorer. He was nicknamed the Tiger. For some reason, Portuguese-speaking countries like calling their players Tigers. Hmm. And he was also nicknamed the King of Football after a tour in Europe in 1925 in which his team won 90% of their games. Besides stats, he won numerous collective and individual awards. He's won 10 trophies in his career. He also ended up 9 times as the top scorer in Brazilian football. In his last 5 seasons, and as he was getting older, he only played local football, and as a consequence, he wasn't called to the national team to play in the World Cups. Arthur retired in 1935, at the age of 43. After that, he worked in a liquor company, spending the rest of his working years there. He then died in 1969 after a long battle with Parkinson's disease. Arthur was someone to aspire to. He challenged a lot of preconceived norms and laid the groundwork for generations to come. Larbi Ben Barak, Africa's first great and one of the very first to play on European soil. Born in 1914 in Morocco, near the city of Casablanca. As an orphan child, he spent most of his childhood playing football in the streets with his friends. But before starting his football career, and as a result of the poor conditions he lived in, he began working since the early age of 14 as a carpenter. Then he started his senior career a couple years later in a local Moroccan team. Fast forward eight years later, he was signed for Olympique de Marseille in 1938. In that same year, he was selected for the French national team. Well, back then Morocco was a French colony, that's why he played for France. Unfortunately for him, in the end of the season, World War II started, and he took a year off from football. Then in 1940, he took refuge in Casablanca, and he played for Widad for five years. He had a lot of experiences with a lot of different clubs, Stade René, USM Belabas, and he also returned to Olympique de Marseille for one last season. His most memorable years were with Atletico Madrid, who bought him for 17 million francs. You should know that back then, that was the biggest sign-in ever in Spain. That's around 100 million dollars in today's money. He was very successful with Atletico, winning two league titles in 1950 and 1951, and a Spanish Super Cup in 1951. His attack and playmaking role and his general style of playing was one of the reasons that inspired Real Madrid to buy Alfredo de Stefano in 1953. He was so praised by the Colchoneros and they nicknamed him the Black Pearl. Yeah, he's the first Black Pearl, not Pele. Speaking of Pele, he once commented on the Moroccan and said that he was the god of football. Ben Barak retired in 1956 after a 30 year long career at the age of 42. We don't have his full career statistics, but only the ones from the time he played in Europe. 299 games scoring 151 goals, 
and he has seven trophies in his belt. There's a movie about his story and his career, and it narrates the difficulties he had and his sad lonely life, and also how he was never given some recognition in his home country. In September of 1992, he died alone in his apartment in Casablanca. It was only a week later that his dead body was found. In June of 1998, six years after his death, he was awarded the FIFA Order of Merit. It's the highest honor awarded by FIFA. The award is presented at the annual FIFA Congress and it is normally awarded to people who are considered to have made a significant contribution to association of football. The likes of Pele, Cruyff and Lev Yashin have also been awarded. Let's take a moment and reflect a little. Now, you have these footballers who were the top of the crop back in the days and who inspired countless of other generations, but for some reason no one is talking about them and it makes you think a little about today's players. You know, Messi, Ronaldo, Iniesta, Ronaldinho, Zidane, etc, etc. In a hundred years from now, will they be forgotten as well? A lot has changed since then. In 2019, football is a profession. The tactics and the styles of playing evolved. It's a religion for some, and for others, their entire livelihoods revolve around it. My question is how will football look like in a hundred years from now? For example, in 2119, 2119, 2119. Hmm. I guess now you have an idea about what the next video will be about. Spoilers, it's gonna be hot. Well, we've arrived at the end of this video. Subscribe if you haven't already and activate the bell icon so that you don't miss any of my rare uploads. Yeah, I don't make a lot of videos and that bell helps you remembering me. Thanks for watching and until next time.